And as Gustavo was introducing me, I actually worked for the police for five years. So I, I always want to start with a picture of me working in the police department in Mexico City. And this was my team, a person working in the army, a person working for the uh, traffic police, a person that used to actually go after criminals, the second from left to right, um, a former uh, investigative police uh, here, Miguel. And we together tried to come up with a model to try to understand what happens with crime. This is the last day I worked for the police department in Mexico City. You can tell that I'm extremely tall because like, I'm not actually standing on anything, I'm just that tall. <laughs> and so this is actually the bunker that we have for security in Mexico City, a C5 or 56. And I, I want to show this because usually when people think like, oh, Mexico has a lot of crime, they would think, oh, Mexico is not trying, right? They don't try hard enough, but we tried. We invested. This is a new bunker of security where we are just in Mexico City monitoring 60,000 cameras. Just building that thing that you're looking at costed $500 million and is one of the most expensive security budgets that we have ever allocated for something like this. We are following in these cameras people that look suspicious and we follow them for hours until they do something and we are actually very successful. And with mathematics, we can tell which cameras to look. And that person will be successfully committing a crime, and we actually do it. So this, I worked for five years, and then I did my master's and PhD in mathematics and crime, because obviously there are more questions to be asked, right? And one, the one that I wanted to present today is related to Mexican cartoons. If anyone has a question, by the way, please feel free to interrupt them. Um, cartoons, and I know that I have to start with a photo of what is a cartoon. Uh, because usually people don't consider cartoon as like a big thing. But when I speak about cartoons, please imagine an army. It is basically an army like that. This is the biggest cartoon in Mexico called Cartel Jalisco. And they are pretty active in the media and they show photos like this in social media where what you're fighting is Really, they have tanks, they have cars, they have the budget. You see the weapons that they have and this, they all have the same Cartel Jalisco Nueva Generación because it is this big the problem. It's not a tiny gang, it's not like a few robberies in the street, it's, you're fighting this with the state, right? And to be honest, Mexico is extremely violent and has become extremely violent. Like our policies are not working. I'm here just showing you a random set of countries in the world and as Gustavo was saying, this is why it's connected to many things. Migration, because people leave Mexico because it's so violent. Uh, morbidity, because people die. The homicide rate in Mexico is almost 30 people per 100,000. And if you just take other European, well, some European countries here in Austria is 0.8. So it means we are too, too far away. And even in the best moment in Mexican history, we actually are always more violent so than Austria, at least in the past 40 to 50 years. So this is the actual number of murders in Mexico for the past 32 years. And you can tell that we were trying, we were somehow successful up until the year 2007, 2006, and then from there onwards, actually, Mexico is struggling to do anything related to violence. But here is where we invested $500 million, like exactly around these years. Eh? So don't think that we just let the problem grow. I believe that this is a problem because we don't know how to fight it. It's so serious that we are actually trying with different techniques, different policies, how to fight this problem. But it doesn't mean that we have the right information. So onwards, actually, we are just increasing the, the homicide rate in the country. And something beautiful for me was working with Alejandro and Jan Maria, who's connected. Thank you, Jan, for connecting. Alejandro, unfortunately, passed away in the uh, process of this article. But imagine that we managed to sit together a mathematician, a crime scientist, Jan, and an expert in cartels, Alejandro. 
And the three of us, we had only Zoom calls. Actually, I never met in person Jan Maria, and I never had the pleasure of meeting Alejandro in person either. So everything happened over Zoom, and it was trying to understand how, how, how is it that cartoons survive? For me, that's the actual question. And why, what do I mean by cartoons surviving? If you just think of a cartoon as a sack where you have, I like, don't know, apples inside, and you're taking apples outside of the sack, eventually the sack will be empty because you're taking apples outside, right? But somehow, cartoons manage to do this where they are killing, they kill others, of course, there's violence that is not only cartoons. But this shift, most of it is related to cartoons, right? This jump from 8 to 28, that is cartoons. So how we see that they manage to kill so much and they don't disappear? Out of natural forces, if you just think of a, a sack of apples and you keep removing them, and violence is not the only thing that they are suffering. Cartoon members, they lose out of this sack of apples but also the state, we incapacitate them, we arrest criminals and we keep arresting them. And even if they are fighting these two forces, the state and themselves, they are still surviving and they survive for 15 years, there's something behind. So we had discussions. Continue, <laughs> Excellent. We had discussions where we tried to understand why and it's like a black box for me. From cartoons, we know almost nothing. That means we don't know weapons, we don't know the structure, we don't know how many there are. There is no census of cartoons, so don't expect that there's going to be a person counting. Are you a member of Cartel Jalisco? So then I can, that doesn't happen, obviously. So that for me is a black box. We don't know. But what I do know is something that comes out of it. The number of members that get incapacitated, that means arrested by the state, and the number of members that are murdered. If I combine those two, I observe casualties and incapacitations. So I, discussing with Gianmaria and Alejandro, we came up with this model. Cartoons increase, and they are represented by this dot, okay? Increase in size if they recruit. They reduce in size if they get incapacitated by the state. They get reduced if they are uh, fighting against others, so if they have conflict. And naturally, a big organization has some equilibrium, so it cannot just grow indefinitely, and we call that maturity. So, four reasons why a cartoon shifts in size, right? And as a mathematician, I thought, well, this we can actually express in an economical way, right? Then, for the cartoons fighting, data from the media captures these dynamics between different cartels, each cartel represented here again by a dot. If they fight, they are connected with an edge. More fights means that they are more connected. And let me go ahead to these two dynamics. On the left-hand side, if they fight, and on the right-hand side, they are allies, because cartels, they have different dynamics of fighting and being alliances. And what you have in Mexico basically is one big cartel in the top, called Cartel Jalisco, with many satellite arms fighting a big cartel in the bottom part of the figure called Cartel Sinaloa, and a third, Nueva Familia Michoacana. And these are three main cartels with all the satellites and alliances, are the big dynamics that we're observing. But there are, according to the data, 150 active cartels in Mexico. So it's huge, 150 really is gigantic, right? If we combine the idea of, let's see them as a black box, and these networks, then we came up with a differential equation. It's just, I'm, I'm going to express in a mathematical way what I said. A cartoon grows because it recruits members, or it shrinks because the state fights them, it shrinks because it fights other cartoons, and it shrinks because it naturally gets uh, um, saturation point. When a big institution grows, they tend to shrink after a long period, right? So we combine those into a differential equation where I thought we can try and capture the four reasons, the four main reasons why a cartel grows, or put everything in those four reasons, right? They recruit, 
or everything else that makes them smaller. If you think, if you see the equation, the only positive sign that you see here is your which is the only thing why it makes a car too bigger, and all of the others are negative. So it means the only positive gain for car is your equipment. Everything else is just decreasing size, right? Okay, then they kill, they fight, they do something, and we can try and estimate based on the number of incapacitations that we are serving the country and based on the number of murders that we are serving the country, we try to get the numbers, right? We did. We will take some results. And let me show you, of course, one of the big ones that was extremely controversial and up until today it's like the name of the paper. We looked at the size of cartels and combined. I know it's tricky because one cartel is cartel Jalisco and the other one is cartel Sinaloa. But I combined them and that thing is roughly one size, but the number is by itself not super meaningful. I need to compare it with something and I compare it with other employers, right? So I started with, okay, what's the size of Coca-Cola? 320,000 employees. What's the size of Walmart? 230 employers. What's the size of Manpower? And these are the three biggest employers in Mexico. The fourth is American Mobil, a phone company. And then finally, cartels. So the big result that we got is cartels combined. They would be the fifth largest employer in the country with other smaller companies around. This by just trying to estimate the numbers of murders and the numbers of incapacitations that we have observed in the past 10 years, the official data that we observe from Mexico, okay? So this is obviously a critical result and many newspapers reproduced it and so on. But let me show you a mathematical part that I find super interesting. What the model says, if I remove everything and I just leave you with the police and one cartel, if the recruitment of a cartel is small, and this is like a dynamical system, imagine that the size of a cartel is here, the arrows are telling you where the system will move. And this blue arrow tells you that the cartel actually will move to the left hand side where there is no cartels, right? And it doesn't matter how, how big a cartel would be, still the police would be able to dissolve them. If the recruitment is too small, this is always the case. If the recruitment is medium, there is a degenerate point somewhere where there is an equilibrium. And this is quite interesting because there is exactly the mathematical number where the police arrests 10 members and they recruit 10 members. So they are the same size the next week. And the next week, they get arrested 10 members and they recruit 10 members. So again, they are the same size, right? But that is very unstable. If they recruit even more, then you have this new dynamic where very large, okay, they, they shrink. But if the cartel is sufficiently large and they manage to recruit sufficient amount of individuals, then actually what the police does is not sufficient for fighting. And you have this new red region, which actually, instead of the cartels shrinking to the left hand side, cartels are moving to the right hand side with this new equilibrium, right? And that is actually the, 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 the tricky part. Why is it that in Austria we don't have this type of cartels? Well, for me, because you're on the other part, the recruitment of those cartels would be too small. So the police, no matter what, would be able to dissolve them. But in Mexico, we try and try and try, and for 15 years we're trying, but we are in this dynamic. At least in a very figurative way, because of course there are many complicated things behind, but in a, in a nutshell, cartels, they are recruiting at the same speed, or even more than the police is incapacitating. Right? In two dimensions, something similar, so now imagine that you have the size of a cartel one in the horizontal axis, and the size of the second cartel in the vertical axis. A lot of members are here, a lot of members of cartel one and not of cartel two is here and vice versa. And the arrows is telling you where the dynamic would go. So if you start in the green dot, just because the recruitment is small, the police will be able to dissolve them and you finish in the peace state. 
And peace is this, where you have no cartridges, the dream for every Mexican. However, as soon as the recruitment is slightly larger, that is no longer the case. When the recruitment is slightly larger, you start somewhere, and then just because the cartels manage to recruit so much, actually, you go to this point. Or if you start on this side of the diagram, just the dynamics will go to this point. But at least we would have something that I call the peace corridor, because here is a lot of cartels killing each other, but eventually you would finish with no cartels. If cartels recruit even more than this, then you finish with a very tricky situation where the area of peace is actually super small. And now, cartels, wherever you start, they manage to move the dynamic where even one cartel is dominating or the other is dominating, but the peace now becomes not even feasible. Not if you start far away from the white line, right? This is super tricky. Then the next result, what can we do? I work for the police, so I, I try to understand these equations and what can we do? We can try and change the maturity of the culture, although I don't know what that means, sorry. We can try and change the way they fight with each other, so try and change this parameter, but make a cartel fight more, the other also tricky. So for me, if we have controls for fighting uh, violence in Mexico, it has to go with recruitment, that is this parameter, or incapacitation, that is this parameter. I can go to the police and tell them, let's arrest more members, right? I know how to do that, I work for the police, so I know how to tell them, like, we can go after the bad ones, right? Or change something, like, uh, because if this is a mathematical model, I can change parameters and see what will happen. And what we did is, take what the model says between 2012 to 2022 and increase in the number of homicides, vertical axis. And if we just push the model for the next five years, we are doomed. This is the panorama for Mexico. From 120 casualties, we expect 170, just because this is the trend of the, what the model is telling us. But let's change something. Let's change the incapacitations. What if Mexico arrests twice the number of criminals as we are doing today? Nothing. Well, something, because it, does, it's not, it doesn't follow the current trend. But even if Mexico incapacitates twice as many criminals as we do today, in five years Mexico will be more violent than it is today. Right? Even if we arrest twice as many criminals. That is the trickiest result I have ever obtained in my researcher career, because it means we actually are doomed. This is, I know how to incapacitate more criminals, and I thought with a tiny increment we could get something. Not even with double incapacitation spirit groups. Okay, let's see the other parameters. Recruitment. If we reduce recruitment to half, then you see a, a, actually a decrease in the number of homicides. But even if we have the recruitment, we are going to be more violent in 2027 than we were in 2012. That was, for Mexicans, already a very violent year, 2012. Still, with half of the recruitment, Mexico will be more violent. And just because maths allows you, we can try and change the recruitment to zero, a parameter, make it equal to zero. By 2027, Mexico would be more violent than any country in Europe even if recruitment was zero. So this, I promise you, the day I got these results, I had to close my laptop and go home and take a long walk, because the results are extremely negative. It means we are actually a bit lost, right? Obviously, the paper got uh, published, and because it is the fifth largest employer in the world, and also in Mexico, that caught a bit of media attention, right? So you can imagine that since the paper got published, I gave yesterday my interview number 84 in the media. And it's been crazy times, so maybe those that have seen me like Renaud or Dieter have seen that I'm extremely busy all the time because I have given 84 interviews, including Mexican media most, uh, but the paper was in The Guardian, was in Fox News, was in The Independent. 
obviously with the, with the political spin because when Fox News is discussing this result it's not in like a favorable way for Mexicans obviously uh, even we were in the, the Economist and they just copy the figure and they select projections for the next few years and I think the biggest one for me was this guy I'm not sure if anyone knows who this guy is the president of Mexico Right. So the, two days after the paper got published, the president of Mexico grabbed it in a press conference and showed that to me on the left hand side on Twitter. And he was like, I don't know, I was expecting something more favorable. As a researcher, you would expect like your government is behind you and shows like, okay, yeah, thank you very much. No. He said that I'm just trying to defeat his government and that I'm a conservative um, paid by something researcher, whatever. But thank you for the uh, attention that he brought to the manuscript because obviously when the president mentions you, then you get more attention. And I think afterwards there are many unknowns. First, I, I had the honor of working with these beautiful people from Gustav, Stefan, Dieter, Sitter sitting here, Jan, Jonathan, <laughs> you're not. I'm sorry for the picture, this year, but it's the best one I do. <laughs> Um, I'm again very sorry, but this is the photo I could get. And the, the question is as follows. Again, you, you saw the diagram, right? Where we have cartoon one and cartoon two. And what we think, at least what the model is telling us, is that we have some um, number of homicides, and where it's more red, you have more homicides, or cartel influence. Because even if we don't have a big cartel fighting another, one big cartel controls elections and controls the media and controls extortions and so on. So you actually no, no cartel is necessary, right? So let's suppose that more influence is where you have more cartel members and here in the white region is where you wouldn't have influence. And obviously, we in Mexico want to have zero cartels, but the issue is the budget. So we are trying to understand where do we invest our resources in preventing recruitment or incapacitating from one cartel or incapacitating from the other or like an optimal control theory to get the best strategy for going into some state because it's not even clear what is the actual state here that we are in because of the budget restrictions it seems like okay you may decide to favor one cartel or just live in a very constant war between the cartels there are other unknowns. Uh, first is the narco culture. Um, this is a picture from a football player's son. He's turning 14 years old only. And instead of having a theme party on, I don't know, Bob, Sponge, Square Banks, or whatever the name is, or <laughs> the Sims, what I don't know what the 14 year old will be looking at today. The theme party of this football player's son was a narco party. So they dress up all these teenagers in hats that are called La Chapisa, that means one of the cartoons, and they give them weapons and they give them like everything so that they can actually celebrate that they are part of one cartoon. Yeah, but why? And why I mean because of the desirability of this. For me, it's not desirable to join a cartel, but for this 14 year old, they are super happy celebrating Matias' birthday, right? He's only 12 years old, by the way, you can hear that he's 12. And this is a very wealthy family, he's a famous football player. So really, this is part of the narco culture that then turns into this. This is when Cartel Sinaloa was centering a town in Chiapas in the last week of September 2023. They entered the town in Chiapas and the town actually goes and celebrates the entry of this cartel into the town because at least now is cartel Sinaloa better than cartel Jalisco more violent. Yeah, but this is narco culture. Like, how are you going to prevent the recruitment of a cartel if the teenagers are dressed up like this and if in the town they are celebrating like this, right? What is, what is the game here? And then finally, Something that I, I strongly believe is now critical is the situation of El Salvador. If you don't follow much news from Central America, El Salvador 
is one of the most likely countries in the world. It actually got the number one for many years with a murder rate of around 80 or 80 something murders per 100,000 people. So three times Mexico, eh? like huge difference. And then this president called Nayib Bukele got into power. He arrested everyone, basically everyone that looks slightly, you are a member of a gang, you get arrested. And he managed to reduce the murder rate in El Salvador by 95%. Nobody ever in Latin America has ever seen that drop in the level of violence. They had elections last weekend. The guy got re-elected with 85% of the votes. No other president in Latin America has been so popular in actual public elections. Like what one could say Nicolás Maduro, but that doesn't count really, right? I know, I know. Um, but like you have now this situation in Latin America where all of the countries are violent except for one. And they are doing this. And I brought actually two photos of a prison in El Salvador just to put it into context. The issue with this policy, I made some calculations. If Mexico was to follow this policy, we would need to arrest two million people. If Latin America was to follow this policy, we would need to arrest something like the size of Austria just to follow El Salvador's policy. So it's not, it's not actually quite clear where, where the game is, or where the game for the society is, right? So with those questions, I think that what El Salvador did, remember this diagram that I showed you before, where you have the size of a cartel in the horizontal axis, and we have these Latin countries fighting here, and yeah, we reduce a bit the size of a cartel, but then eventually grows or they can grow a bit and then they eventually just circumvent that area. The challenge with El Salvador is that what happened, they arrested a lot of people, more than 100,000 people got into prison. And for me, perhaps this is the result of El Salvador. They actually, with the same system, managed to jump to the other side of the equilibrium. Will this be stable? This is this what we will observe in the long run? We don't know. But for me, it's one of the biggest concerns in Latin America. If other countries, Nicaragua or Colombia, Ecuador or Brazil, Mexico, obviously, we start following this because the guy got 85% of the votes last week. And I think with that, I want to say thank you.